Hello, my name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled A Case Study in Strategic Planning for Educational Facilities. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to visit ASEF online at www.acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's podcast, Mr. Blake Godkin. Mr. Godkin is an educational futurist, strategist, and facilitator. Mr. Godkin helps schools plan for and manage future-focused transformation. While Mr. Godkin's experience is diverse, he has served as an educational planner for various educational planning and design firms, both nationally and internationally. Mr. Godkin's ongoing research focuses on enhancing organizational strategic planning through aspirational thinking. Thank you, Mr. Godkin, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. I am really honored and just so excited to once again have an opportunity to produce some content for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. In a previous interactive lesson and podcast, I was asked to talk about strategic planning as it relates to school facilities. And so for that podcast and pre- and previously produced interactive lesson, I spent some time talking about an eight-step process and some tools and techniques that I have used when facilitating strategic planning specific to school facilities. For this podcast, I'm kind of going to extend that conversation a little bit by talking about a detailed case study that shows how that process can actually be used in a real world situation. So I'm going to talk about some of the pieces that are non-negotiable in that process that really need to be utilized and how they were utilized in this example case study. But I'm also going to look at some pieces that really need to be flexible for particular needs needs of particular projects. The case study that I'll be focusing on for this podcast is the Barbara Cardwell Career Preparatory Center. It's part of the Irving Independent School District in Irving, Texas. Now this might sound a little familiar to some of you because in my previous interactive lesson on the ASAF website, I did briefly cover this project, but we're going to dig a little deeper for this. And so to get things started, I'd like to share a brief story. This case study, this project really has an interesting past, an interesting history. In fact, in the mid-19th century in uh, northern Texas, there was a group of families from diverse religious backgrounds that decided to settle just outside of the Dallas area. Now, they had a goal to create a unified school for their children. They had a teacher selected for this union school, and the gentleman's name who was selected as the first teacher was a man named Bowers. And so that's where the town became known as Union Bower, Texas. And around 1960, that township was annexed into the city of Irving. With the surrounding community founded on the basis of a school designed for unique groups of students, it was so appropriate that the Union Bauer Center for Learning became known as Irving School for Non-Traditional Learning. More recently, that school was redesigned, renovated, and then renamed into the now known Barbara Cardwell Career Preparatory Center. Cardwell Prep, as it's known by many people, is an alternative learning camp campus in Irving uh, ISD, and its enrollment is about 450 students. It's got a very, very specific mission. The mission statement is to successfully empower and graduate students in a non-traditional environment focused on personalized, quality core instruction, career pathways, and real-world experience. 
Before I get started really digging into this case study, let me state a disclaimer. This is a real world project. This project was actually completed and uh, so it should be known by the listener that this is not kind of an ideal situation that's going to match up perfectly with a theoretical strategic planning process. That said, there are some non-negotiable parts of any process that really need to be utilized and then because of nuances and specific needs of clients, there are kind of pieces within a theoretical theoretical framework that need to be adjusted, shifted around, or in some cases deleted entirely. Getting started with a selection of the external facilitator. I was honored to be selected as the external facilitator for this project and to, to shepherd the strategic planning phase of this project. When it comes to how I go about serving as an external facilitator, there's a number of things that I really want to understand about the project, about the client, about the community that is going to be impacted by the outcome. And so for this, I felt like the best way to understand this unique population of at-risk learners was to serve as a substitute geometry teacher. And in fact, I got that opportunity from the principal uh, to help develop lesson plans uh, alongside a a master teacher at the campus and really got to understand some of the the unique stories of of the instructors, of the staff, and most importantly, of the students that frequent Barbara Cardwell Career Preparatory Center. That really helped me understand the needs of the client and helped me best serve as a facilitator for this process. When it came to finding an internal coordinator to serve as a liaison between the campus and the external vendors, there was really one clear-cut selection that needed to be made, and that was the campus principal. In many cases, the campus principal isn't always an ideal internal coordinator, but in this case, this principal had a really good understanding of at-risk learners and the unique needs of this campus. The scope of this project allowed this principal to be able to have the opportunity to be engaged fully, primarily because the learning model for the campus was also having a drastic uh, revolution happening to it in parallel with the facilities design. So the principal needed to serve as that central oversight of both processes. Again, with his experience at at at-risk students and his respect that he held from the central administration, campus staff, parents, and students, it made the this uh, principal the ideal candidate as the internal coordinator. When it came to building capacity for strategic thinking among the stakeholders for this process and for this project, a piece of a strategic planning process that I personally feel is very crucial, it just frankly didn't happen in an ideal way. There were a number of reasons why that was the case. Uh, One in particular was that many of the leaders involved in this project believed that acquire too much time on the front end, and frankly, the delivery schedule wasn't designed in such a way to allow for that to happen. Unfortunately, that's just a misunderstanding of the power of capacity building for strategic thinking. In fact, that can really happen at any point in the process, and it'll still have a positive outcome. Strategic thinking can just positively impact really any phase of decision making when it comes to a project like this. It allows for organizations to make truly current decisions in light of future possibilities. The hope for strategic thinking sessions in this case would have been to bring the campus community together to learn more about and further develop the key learning strategies being explored for this campus. The Strategic Planning Task Force was primarily made up of some central Irving ISD administration, as well as some specific staff from the campus, including some teachers. In order to get some other stakeholder input, such as students and other community members, we were able to conduct some mini workshops that were specific to those to those populations from time to time in order to ensure that we did get their input and that it was captured. Data gathering is an ever-evolving living organism of any strategic planning process. And in this case, that was definitely true. One major piece of data that we we wanted to gather was an affinity analysis. We wanted to understand where the key stakeholders felt certain spaces needed to be located in order to truly be successful. And so we, in fact, uh, were able to facilitate individual workshops with individual populations. For example, 
I employed the tool of gaming chips to to facilitate a an affinity analysis for just students only. I did this with administrators as well and teachers as well, but for this students only workshop, it was really interesting because I asked the students with the redesigned facility what spaces should be located near one another. The real impact of the students' input on affinity will be kind of gleaned later in this podcast. As for capturing this kind of data, what I did was I crafted a tool called the Creative Brief, and that served as the central document where all the key data and the rest of the vision for this project were going to be collected. When it came to crafting and articulating the core beliefs for this project, uh, we had to understand that these beliefs were the non-negotiable, commonly held values that needed to be fully supported and not contradicted by the redesign of this facility. By way of an example, one of the core beliefs that was articulated was at-risk learners will be more successful if they graduate with real-world experience and the necessary skills to pursue a specific specific career. This very core belief, in fact, drove the design of five distinct career pathways, also known as houses, that would become the new learning model for this campus. In fact, each house would contain no more than about 87 students each. It turned out that this design also supported another core belief for the campus, which was students will more likely stay engaged when a larger population of learners is organized organized into a smaller set of cohorts. When it came to articulating the commitments for this uh, planning process, they ended up taking the form of 11 clear and distinct problem statements, also known as design problems. And those needed to be addressed by the facility redesign process. In his book, Problem Seeking, Willie Pena stated that problem statements stress the uniqueness of the project and can serve as premises for design. In fact, one example uh, of a commitment as stated as a design problem for this project was in what ways might the environment create a comfortable setting for downtime? For many students, the campus served as a home away from home, sometimes and unfortunately in many cases a safer home away from home. And so this design problem encouraged us to explore unique ways in which we could borrow uh, a certain percentage of square footage, for example, from the library's allotment in order to create individual common rooms for each career pathway house. Uh, this this allowed us to give each house a place for students to be able to study, uh, work on projects, relax, or even meet with teachers or counselors. Like the beliefs, uh, these commitments or design problems were also captured and then included in the ever-evolving creative brief. When it came to approval, this really happened all throughout each stage of the process. In fact, for this project, uh, this constant approval and consistent approval process uh, really came to head when it when it when we look back at the gaming chips exercise that I facilitated with the students. It showed that the students would have preferred and uh, that the theater arts classroom be located near the library so that they could more easily do research for their th- theater arts projects during class. The interesting situation with this was that the central administration and and even the faculty members hadn't even thought about this idea. In fact, they had no idea that the students had even an opinion on such a seemingly unimportant spatial relationship. And so throughout the design phase, the architectural firm realized that they needed to make a number of changes to the floor plan in order to make sure they respected this student perspective. Because this was something that really, when it came down to it, the administrators and and the faculty and the staff wanted to make sure stayed true to the design. 
In the end, the creative brief uh, really served as a consistent tool that kept all the key information in one location and helped make sure that the design outcomes were driven by strategic thought, and in particular, strategic thought that was articulated by the people that were going to use the facility, the students, the teachers, and the administrators. And so that tool really helped make sure that the design outcomes responded to these beliefs and commitments um, from the stakeholders. So there you have it. Uh, In a nutshell, that is one example of how strategic planning for school facilities looks when it's actually implemented in the real world. I really hope you found this podcast interesting as well as educational. For more information on strategic planning as it relates to educational facilities, feel free to review my previously published uh, podcast as well as the interactive lesson, both of which can also be found on the ASF website. Uh, Thank you again for listening. Thank you for listening to our podcast today. We hope that you have taken this opportunity to learn from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge regarding strategic planning for educational facilities. ASEP would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Mr. Blake Godkin, and to you for listening to our podcast today.